Welcome everyone and thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Dr. Silkman and I'm from the Foul Play team. Um, recently I did two presentations on Dr. Chris Palahniuk and on Ida Mervell and I discussed the relevance of his findings and how the state handled those findings uh, uh, that were presented in Kathleen Zellner's uh, filing. Today, I like to do a new presentation. And the presentation is entitled, Whose Burnt Cut Pelvic Bones Were at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit? Why should we care if the state didn't? And thankfully for us, someone actually did care enough to ask the hard questions and that person was Kathleen Zellner. And of course, I'm referring to the bones that were found in evidence tag 8675. Uh, in this presentation, I like to have a look at the following um, items. First of all, I'm going to discuss Dr. Stephen Symes affidavit. I'm going to have a look at evidence tag 8675, the so-called suspected human pelvic bones. I'm going to have a look at Dr. Eisenberg's trial testimony, uh, re-evidence tag 8675. I'm going to have a look at the state's response to Dr. Symes' affidavit. And finally, ask the question, whose human cremains were at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit and why it actually matters to find out. Now, what I'm going to be talking about here is uh, discuss Dr. Symes' um, affidavit. And I'll start at point number two. This is Dr. Stephen Symes, uh, and he was employed by Kathleen Zellner. Point two. I have a PhD in physical anthropology with an emphasis on forensic anthropology and am currently employed as a forensic anthropologist by the Department of the Mississippi State Medical Examiner. I have testified extensively in forensic trauma to bone and surrounding tissues. The principal topic of my research and experience has been trauma injuries to the skeleton, including ballistic, blunt, burning, healing bone with a specific focus on sharp force trauma. And as you can see here, uh, Dr. Symes is very well uh, qualified uh, as a forensic anthropologist, and he has written many books. Uh, on the subject, and one of them you can see here on the right hand side, entitled The Analysis of Burned Human Remains. Okay, point number three. I have reviewed all of the photographs of suspected human pelvic bones from evidence tag number 8675 taken by Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, forensic anthropologist. I have also reviewed trial testimony relevant to the attempted identification of pelvic bones found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, evidence tag 8675, including the testimony of <coughs> Dr. Leslie Eisenberg and Dr. Scott Fairgreave. Four, it is my opinion, based upon a reasonable degree of scientific certainty in the field of forensic anthropology, that a, a microscopic examination of the suspected human pelvic bone performed in 2005 would have determined to a high percentage of accuracy whether the pelvic bones were human and b histological slides made in 2005 from the suspected human pelvic bones 
would have determined to a high percentage of accuracy whether the pelvic bones in evidence tag uh, number 8675 were human. So what um, Dr. Symes is saying is that both microscopic examination and histological slides should have been made of the suspected human pelvic bones. And of course, they weren't. Point number five. It is also my opinion, based upon a reasonable degree of scientific certainty in the field of forensic anthropology, that it is certainly below the standard of practice for a reasonably well-qualified and competent forensic anthropologist at this current time and place to not perform microscopic and histological examinations of the possible human pelvic bones. And it may have been below the standard of practice in 2005 for a reasonably well-qualified and competent forensic anthropologist to not have performed microscopic and histological examinations of the possible human pelvic bones in evidence tag number 8675. Point number six, further, it was below the standard of practice for a reasonably well-qualified and competent forensic anthropologist to have relied exclusively upon photographs of the pelvic bones to complete the forensic examination. So quite clearly here, Dr. Symes mentions the following, below the standard of practice. So in other words, Dr. Symes is being very, very critical of the state's forensic anthropologist, Dr. Leslie Eisenberg. Point number seven. It is also my opinion, based upon, based on a reasonable degree of scientific certainty in the field of forensic anthropology, that it may be below the standard of practice in 2005 for reasonably well-qualified and competent forensic anthropologists to have performed an examination and interpretation of bone trauma without microscopic microscopic assistance. And again, um, Dr. Symes is being very critical of Dr. Leslie Eisenberg by stating that she was below the standard of practice. So in other words, uh, Dr. Symes was essentially stating that Dr. Leslie Eisenberg had not done complete analysis of the pelvic bones that were found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. Okay, so what we're talking about here is evidence tag 8675 and these are the so-called suspected human pelvic bones and you can see uh, the bones that are on the uh, left hand side uh, these were relatively small bone fragments but their shape and morphology indicated that these bone fragments had indeed come from a pelvis and we can see here on the right hand side, um, Dr. Eisenberg stated where these bone fragments had come from. They'd come from the sacrum and also from the pelvis. But what was not known at that stage, were these bones human or animal in origin? Now, what Dr. Symes is essentially saying is that Dr. Eisenberg did not do the appropriate tests to determine whether these cut, burnt cremains were indeed of human origin or of animal origin. Okay, so where did evidence tag 8675 come from? Well, if we have a look at this report, we can see that uh, these uh, cremains were found in a debris pile. 
and they were found on the 11th of November 2005. And Dr. Eisenberg wrote up a report and she described the presence of three quarry piles uh, that contain bones. And as we can see in quarry pile number one, we have evidence tag 8675. And in Dr. Eisenberg's report, she stated the following about quarry pile number one, and I quote, possible human burnt cut pelvis fragments and that constituted evidence tag 8675. Now, uh, the GPS coordinates were stated for uh, evidence tag 8675. If we go to Google Earth and we place in those coordinates, we can see the exact location uh, where those bone fragments were found in evidence tag 8675. And what strikes one immediately is that these bone fragments were nowhere near the Avery Salvage Yard. So this now allowed us to do an important comparison. Now, we know that uh, human cremains were found in multiple locations. We know about the human cremains that allegedly were found in Stephen Avery's burn pit. And we know from the examination of those uh, cremains, uh, Dr. Bennett was able to find a, a ilium bone, which is part of the pelvis. And he stated that it came from an adult human female. Uh, there were additional human cremains found as well. Also, uh, human cremains were found in yonder burn barrel number two. And we have at least one quarry pile here uh, shown as evidence tag 8675. Uh, and that was examined by Dr. Eisenberg. And Dr. Eisenberg stated that the pelvic bone fragments had cut marks, but she stated that they were suspect human. Uh, also in the debris piles, there were other human cremains. All right, so how did Ken Kratz handle the fact that um, the investigators or the searchers uh, had found cremains uh, in the Manitowoc County gravel pit? So what did Ken Kratz say about it? I quote, the bones were moved but they were moved by Mr. Avery. These bones in the quarry, I'm gonna take about 20 seconds to talk about because the best anyone can say is that they are possible human. What does possible human mean? Well, it means we don't know what it is, all right? The best anthropologists in the world don't know what these bones are. Dr. Eisenberg didn't know what they were Dr. Fairgreave didn't know what they were. He agreed with that. And you heard a stipulation being read to you by a person by the name of Les McCurdy. Um, stipulation just means an agreement between the parties that these bones, we felt it important enough, were sent out to the FBI. And Les McCurdy from the FBI determined that these bones were so degraded that they were in such a shape that even though testing what's called mitochondrial DNA testing, whether they are human or not, could not, even by the FBI, be determined. So the bones in the quarry are really not evidence in this case. However, let's examine evidence tag 8675. Now, Dr. Eisenberg was questioned about this uh, in the Stephen Avery trial. And the uh, prosecutor who was questioning her was Special Prosecutor Fallon. And this is discussing the iliac blade that was found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. And uh, you can see it highlighted in the um, shape. Question, 
Um, did you find any evidence of uh, of the superior aspect of an iliac blade? Answer. Uh, yes, I did. And uh, for everyone in the room but me, I'll show you where that is. Question. Uh, that's my next question. Answer. And um, question. Thank you. Bow me out. Answer. The, um, the pelvis is made up of three different bones. The left hip bone, the right hip bone, and the sacrum which is the bone that sits at the base of the spine and actually is the lowest portion, lowermost portion of the spine. And the iliac crest is this top area here. What you actually feel if you rub your hand on your hip bone, that's known as the iliac crest. Question, all right. Now the bone that you suspected to be the iliac crest can you say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that that uh, is human bones? Human bone? Answer. No, sir, I cannot. Dr. Eisenberg was then questioned about the sacral iliac articulation that were also found at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. Question. Did you find evidence uh, or of a bone that's referred to as the sacral iliac articulation? Answer, actually, those are two bones. It's where the right half of the sacrum or the lower, lowermost part of the spine um, articulates. It's actually adjoined with the right side of the hip bone. <clears throat> Question, and in terms of that, a suspected bone fragment, can you say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that that was human bone? Answer, um, I cannot. Now, Dr. Eisenberg was then questioned uh, basically about the same bones, but this time by uh, Dean Strang, uh, who was for the defense. So uh, Dr. Eisenberg was questioned about the sacral iliac articulation that was found at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. And you can see here uh, in the red circle. Now, what I want you to note that this particular bone had two cuts made in the bone itself, uh, likely by a very sharp knife. And you can actually see uh, inside the bone fragment. So, Dr. Eisenberg was questioned, and her response was, answer. And so, using the long bone as an example may not be an accurate comparison. Secondly, the thinness of the outside bone of these pelvic cut fragments is not inconsistent with the thickness I would expect to see relative to the honeycomb uh, in humans. Now, by that, this is what she meant. On the inside of the bone fragment, you, no you notice the structure uh, referred to as honeycomb bone, because it looks like honeycomb. Uh, the proper name for it is trabecular bone. On the outside, uh, you can see a thin outside layer. That's known as the cortical layer. Uh, and the honeycomb and the thinness of the cortical bone is reminiscent of what you would find uh, in humans. Okay, now Dr. Eisenberg was then questioned further uh, by Dean Strang. Question, and let me ask you just maybe the simplest, most straightforward question here. Is what made you suspect that these pieces of pelvic bone could be human? Answer, the contours of the bone and more particularly the shape of what we call the articular surfaces where one bone fits with another bone at the hip joint. Question, those appeared consistent with a human being? Answer, with the shape 
and the contours of what would be expected in a human bone. So <laughs> this is indeed bizarre because what Dr. Eisenberg was saying um, to the um, state's attorney was that no, 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 no. She couldn't say that they were human bone. Yet what uh, Dr. Eisenberg was saying to uh, the defense attorney, uh, Dean Strang was, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm seeing is entirely consistent with being human bone. So clearly Dr. Eisenberg uh, was saying different things to the different attorneys. So the upshot of this is that she couldn't rule out uh, those bone fragments that were found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit as indeed belonging to a human being. Now, this is very, very important. And so Dr. Eisenberg was questioned about what type of analysis uh, she did on those bone fragments. Now, Dr. Eisenberg, she's a forensic anthropologist. So she knows what the roles are uh, that a forensic anthropologist does. And I quote, this is from her manual. Uh, one of the key roles for forensic anthropologists is to determine or distinguish human from non-human remains. So her job is to have a look at bones and determine whether they come from a human being or from a non-human being, for example, an animal. So this is uh, Prosecutor Fallon who's questioning Dr. Eisenberg. Question, Doctor, were you able to perform any other tests uh, on these bones to determine if they were of human origin? Answer, uh, no, there were no other tests that I performed. Question, and why is that? Answer, um, I did not, uh, there are, uh, are uh, there is the potential for um, using um, microscopes to look, for example, to try and confirm if suspected human bone might actually be human bone or animal bone. But given the condition of the remains, I did not believe um, that cutting into the bone uh, that they would survive that, those kinds of tests. And so I did not perform them. That was it. So uh, she actually had the ability to determine whether those bone fragments were indeed human or animal, but she chose not to do them. So in actual fact, uh, Dr. Eisenberg failed to do any microscopic or histological analysis on those bone fragments. And remember, I showed you in the previous slides uh, Dr. Eisenberg actually didn't have to cut into the bone. Uh, someone had done it, obviously the murderer had done it, using a sharp, sharp object like a blade. Well, lo and behold, as fate has it, Dr. Eisenberg was also working on another case uh, virtually at the same time. Uh, Dr. Eisenberg was the forensic anthropologist in the Christine Rudy murder case. Uh, and in that particular case, Christine Rudy uh, had been killed in a very similar manner to the way Teresa Horbach was. Now, in this particular case, um, there were human cremains that were scattered uh, over various locations. And one of those locations was a burn pit. And as you can see, uh, some of those bone fragments uh, were labelled as possible fetal bones. Now, Dr. Eisenberg had surmised that in the burn pit, um, this is the Christine Rudy case, there were human fetal bones. Now, these bones were sent off uh, to a company called Microanalytica. And what they use is a technique called protein radioimmune assay. Uh, and what they do is they use antibodies and they look at binding studies on the bones. So 
even though the bones themselves were burnt, uh, the laboratory was able to do a protein radioimmune assay. And lo and behold, uh, those suspected possible uh, human fetal bones, uh, well, the animal antibody bound much, much more strongly than the human one. So uh, it was surmised that they were not fetal bones, human fetal bones at all, but they actually belonged to an animal. Well, many months later, they found the torso of Christine Rudy, and there was an intact uh, fetus inside the, uh, the torso. So this test, this protein radioimmune assay, confirmed that those cremains were not human, but were indeed animal. So let's have a look at this, and it is important. This was a test that was routinely available uh, to test uh, human crema or cremains. And I'll read it out to you. It's known as the protein radioimmunoassay. PRIA is a complement to DNA analysis, especially in cases where DNA is degraded or absent and taxonomic information is essential. It is of particular use in cases where heating or extreme environmental conditions have rendered DNA analysis impossible. In such cases, the proteins used in PRIA analysis often survive to provide genetic information. PRIA is most applicable in cases where human versus animal origin is desired in morphologically unidentified, unidentifiable bone fragments. The method also has some limited utility in identifying the species origin in the case of positive animal identification. In other words, if it comes up animal, you can determine from what animal species it actually comes from. So here's the question, and this is what Dr. Syme is asking the state. That is, why didn't Dr. Eisenberg order a protein radioimmunoassay on any of the cremains? That simple test would have determined whether the bones were indeed human or whether they were from an animal. But Dr. Eisenberg chose not to do so, not even to put the bones underneath a microscope, which would not have resulted in the destruction of the bones. It appeared to me that Dr. Eisenberg did not want to know the origin of those bones, be it they were human or of animal in origin. She just said in court, suspect possible human. Okay, well now we have a look at the state's response uh, to Kathleen Zellner. And I'm particularly interested in how they handled Dr. Stephen Symes uh, affidavit in regards to the uh, cremains that were found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. So how did the state deal with Dr. Symes' affidavit? I quote, Avery's claim that Strang and Buting were ineffective for failing to hire Symes was, and is, particularly insufficient. They did hire and present a forensic anthropologist who specialised in burned remains, Dr. Scott Fairgrieve. So Avery's claim really is they were ineffective for failing to hire this particular expert, Symes. But an attorney is not deficient for hiring one qualified expert over another. See Hinton versus Alabama. Ineffective assistance, quote, does not consist of the hiring of an expert who, though qualified, was not qualified enough. The selection of an expert witness is a paradigmatic example of the type of strategic choice 
that when made after thorough investigation of the law and facts is virtually unchallengeable. Neither Avery's motion nor his brief says anything about why, from Strang and Buting's perspective, before trial, it was unreasonable for them to rely on Fairgreave, who had testified for the prosecution in every case in his career until this one, and who refuted the state's forensic anthropologist, Dr. Leslie Eisenberg's conclusions. Avery gave no evaluation of Fairgreave's trial testimony, nor discuss why Symes could accomplish something that Fairgreave's testimony, coupled with cross-examining Eisenberg, did not. Nor did Avery provide any explanation why it would matter if the charred bones found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit were determined definitively to be human, which is all he claims Symes' revel revelation could have been. Though Avery did not even establish that Symes would have said this, Symes' affidavit says only that he believes a microscopic examination could have determined whether the bones in the gravel pit were human, though it gives no explanation why Symes believes he could have accomplished this through microscopic examination when the FBI could not. It's entirely possible Symes would have been unable to do so or would have determined the bones were not human. So Avery again simply relies on unfounded speculation that Symes would have even established anything relevant. Now, this is pretty remarkable when you think about this. I think the state forgot what the FBI actually did with those uh, cremains. And I quote, this is Attorney Fallon in the Stephen Avery trial. Attorney Fallon, yes, thank you, Judge. The parties are agreed that bone fragments identified as human from the burn pit behind Stephen Avery's garage Bone fragments identified as human from burn barrel number two behind the residence of Barb Yonder and bone fragments suspected as possible human bones from the quarry pile in the Redont gravel pit south of the Avery salvage yard were sent to the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia on November the 2nd, 2006, November the 7th, 2006 and December 19th, 2006, to attempt further DNA analysis. If called to testify, Dr. Leslie McCurdy of the FBI DNA Analysis Unit would testify that due to the condition of the submitted bone fragments, no DNA examinations could be conducted. But there's one problem. Dr. Symes does not want to do a DNA analysis on the cremains. The state misunderstood what Dr. Symes was pushing for. I continue. Avery claims that if Symes determined the bones in the Manitowoc pit were human, the state's entire theory against Mr. Avery would have collapsed. But this is simply false. Both Eisenberg and Fairgreave testified that some of the bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit could possibly be human. Miss Horbuck's remains were already found in multiple places, meaning they were obviously moved, which both Eisenberg and Fairgreave testified to. Avery failed to explain why, if the bones in the pit were human, and Miss Horbach's, he or his accomplice, Brendan Dassey, could not have put them there. And Fairgreave testified that in his professional opinion, Miss Horbach's remains had been moved to Avery's burn pit 
and it was not the primary burnt site. Adding one more location for Miss Horbuck's remains to be found does not shake the state's case against Avery at all. Finally, Avery's speculative leap that if any of Miss Horbuck's remains were found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, then she must have been murdered there is supported neither by Symes' affidavit nor anything else. Symes would have added nothing. So it is quite clear uh, that the state are aggressively going after Dr. Symes' affidavit, basically stating that, I quote, Symes would have had added nothing. And that's quite damning. Now, here's the problem. The state, again, is purely speculating because we know that no bone fragments have been tested. The only DNA that's been extracted was from a charred muscle tissue that was found attached to a bone. But we know that no bone, no bone fragments have as yet been tested. I continue. Avery asserts only that if testing revealed that the bone fragments in the quarry belonged to the victim, it would establish that the victim's remains were not under Avery's exclusive control. That is a conclusory assertion unsupported by any facts. Avery never explains why, if the bone fragments belong to the victim, it would be impossible for Avery to have planted the fragments in the quarry, or how his not having exclusive control of the victim's remains after the murder would establish or even suggest that Avery was not the real killer. He fails to argue how the existence of human bone fragments found in the quarry support any of his arguments that individual A, Scott Blodorn, Ryan Hilliges, Bobby Dassey, or Scott Tadich is the real killer. Thus, the only thing Avery has established is that testing the bone fragments found in the quarry may lead to an investigation that could go in any number of directions. He has not established how the bone fragment evidence has apparent exculpatory value. Hugh Banks. Well, here's the big problem that I don't think the state really comprehends, and that is, why would Stephen Avery plant some of the cremains in three separate debris piles in the Manitowoc County gravel pit if he's going to go to all the bother and hassle of bringing cremains to the Manitowoc County gravel pit why not bring all of them there why leave incriminating bone fragments literally in your backyard I continue Avery tries to do an end run around the apparently exculpatory analysis by asserting that the bone fragment evidence is material evidence because the combination of Wisconsin Stat 968.205 and 974.07 codified a right to post-conviction DNA testing. Whether evidence is material has nothing to do with these statutes. Constitutionally material uh, evidence means evidence that creates a reasonable probability that if the evidence had been available to the defence, the result of the trial would have been different, Bagley. But the bone fragments were available to the defence and they did not make a difference at trial. The bone fragments were not apparently exculpatory. Additionally, there are fragments from the quarry that may or may not be human still in evidence available for testing. 
Thus Avery has also failed to establish that he cannot obtain comparable evidence for testing. Regarding the potentially exculpatory standard under Youngblood, Avery has also failed to establish that the bone fragments were potentially exculpatory. A criminal defendant must show bad faith on the part of the state when the state fails to preserve evidence, quote, of which no more can be said than that it could have been subjected to tests, the results of which might have exonerated the defendant. State versus Greenwell. Absent such a showing, there is no due process violation. I continue. Avery has not established any potential usefulness of further testing of the evidence found in the quarry. At trial, Defence Counsel made use of the state's inability to discern whether the fragments recovered from the quarry were human. Avery does not argue how a definitive determination that the fragments were human is material. There is no discussion of how or why these remains being found to be human would support a claim that Avery was not the killer. There are no asserted facts establishing how, if the quarry bone fragments are human, that Avery would have had would have a viable third party suspect defence under the rules of State versus Denny. There is no analysis of motive, opportunity or a direct connection to the crime related to these fragments. Now pay close attention to this last paragraph. Avery offers no fact or analysis demonstrating why it's not possible that Avery himself or his convicted accomplice, Brendan Dassey, placed the bones in the quarry to divert attention from himself and escape detection. Avery fails to tell us how a possible third location of Horbach's remains possesses any exculpatory value. Uh, and remember, we discussed that if Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery were going to place cremains at the Manitowoc County gravel pit in three different debris pile, why on earth would they leave incriminating bones in literally their own backyard and furthermore in Brendan's uh, mother's burn barrel? It makes absolutely no sense at all. And as I state, let me re-emphasize, why would Stephen leave cremains in his own backyard out in the open? It honestly makes no sense. I continue. Even if Avery could establish that the bone fragments were potentially exculpatory, which he has not, he failed to establish that the state acted in bad faith. A defendant can prove bad faith, quote, only if one, the officers were aware of the potentially exculpatory value or usefulness of the evidence they failed to preserve, and two, the officers acted with official animus or made a conscious effort to suppress exculpatory evidence, State versus Lodki. Uh, Avery established neither. The State released some but not all of the bone fragments on September 20, 2011. By that time, this court had issued a decision denying Avery's request for new trial. The bone fragments were not part of Avery's direct appeal. State versus Avery. There were no pre-trial requests made by trial counsel and there was no request by appellate counsel during direct appeal to examine any of the bone fragments at issue. The state made reasonable efforts to determine the identity of the bone fragments at issue when it sent the items to the FBI. The FBI could not 
test the items. But what the state failed to understand was that Dr. Symes didn't want to test for DNA. He wanted to get those bones and examine them microscopically and also do histological studies in order to determine whether those bone fragments were either human or animal. Okay, so to summarize, Dr. Symes wants to test the bones using non-DNA techniques. That is important. And remember, Dr. Eisenberg never did this, but Dr. Symes wanted to use non-DNA techniques of the use of microscopy and histological uh, staining to determine whether those bones, whether those cremains were indeed human or animal. I continue. When these items were released to the family, the state did not know their origin. The state did preserve the bone fragments clearly identified as the remains of Teresa Horbach and those that could be identified as being female human bone. Under these circumstances, there is no bad faith. Avery is due no relief. So the state believes it's given the knockout punch to both Kathleen Zellner, her experts, and to Stephen Avery. But there's something not quite right, and we know this because Dr. Eisenberg, in her report, uh, examined the cremains that were found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. Now remember, there were three different debris piles. She examined those bones and in her report, she's got the following. I quote, calcined human bone fragments. Most bone fragments are all cut. Bone fragments are human. Burnt calcined human bone fragments with cut edges. Cut, burned human bone possible human burnt cup pelvis fragments. So we have this crazy situation here, guys. And that is the state's own forensic anthropologist had identified cut human bone fragment cremains in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. Yet these were not discussed at the Stephen Avery trial. And uh, Ken Kratz said they weren't evidence at all. Now, this is the Queso report uh, in which the uh, bone uh, fragments that were in various uh, Ziploc bags, uh, they, went, they went through them. Uh, attorney Garn and Attorney Fallon uh, went through all the property tags. They had Dr. Eisenberg's report and it was Garn and Fallon that actually determined which bones could be returned to the Hallbach family. Now notice, this is property tag 8675. And it says, the human bones were separated from the rest of the contents and photographed. And the amazing thing is this, they did this to all the property tags, all the Ziploc bags that contain bones. They apparently removed the human bones. And if you look at the CASO report, this is the CASO report that Kathleen Zona uh, stated she never had, originally never had. And it states, and I'll quote, after all bone fragments that were determined to be able to return to the Hallbox by Attorney Fallon and Attorney Garn were completed the items were transformed, transformed or transferred to Whiting Funeral Home in the presence of Sergeant Investigator Mark Wiget and myself. The packaging for all the items returned were retained by the Calumet County Sheriff's Department in secure storage. Now, this is truly remarkable. The state just argued that uh, it didn't know what the origins of those cremains were. Yet, they gave a whole bunch of bones back 
to the Horbach family. Now, I want to state this. This is truly bizarre. And I'll quote, As a parent, would you accept animal bones or bones from another victim as being representative of your murdered loved one? It just simply is crazy. If the state had the opportunity to determine whether those are cremains were human or animal, why didn't Dr. Eisenberg perform those tests? What were they frightened of? What were they hiding? So, thank God and thank goodness, uh, Kathleen Zona asked the hard questions, right? So she asked, okay, whose human cremains were at the Manitowoc County gravel pit? And I quote, point 13, therefore the identification of the Manitowoc gravel pit bone fragments as Miss Hallbarks is relevant and material because it will prove the murder and mutilation did not occur in a location tied exclusively to Mr. Avery. No reasonable trier of fact would conclude or could conclude that if Mr. Avery murdered and mutilated Miss Horbuck in the Manitowoc gravel pit, that he would move her bones to his own burn pit and thereby incriminate himself, right? So if the Manitowoc gravel pit was the primary burn location, what on earth would um, Stephen Avery be bringing back bones to his own property and yonder burn barrel number two? It makes no sense at all. Point number 14. If the new DNA testing identifies Miss Horbach's bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, two inferences are reasonable. Namely, Mr. Avery is not the murderer and the bones recovered from Mr. Avery's burn pit were planted. There is a reasonable probability this new evidence could or would undermine confidence in the jury's verdict. Now, one must remember that none of the cremains were tested for DNA because the cremains were burnt. However, a new machine was developed known as the anti-rapid DNA system. Uh, if the human cremains were available, if the cremains were available, uh, the inventor of the anti-rapid DNA system was confident that he could extract uh, DNA from the uh, cremains and obtain a DNA data to determine whether the cremains uh, were obviously human uh, or were from Teresa Horbach. And the final point, close to the final point, regarding the possible human pelvic bones, Dr. Stephen Symes would conduct the examination of bone of those bone fragments with his electron microscope, which was constructed in 2013. Additionally, Dr. Symes would make histological slides of the bones, which would confirm the origin of those fragments with absolute certainty. Even if this examination could have been done with a 2005-2007 era microscope and histological slide, we still have the right to make an ineffective assistance of counsel argument against Mr. Buting and Mr. Strang for failing to perform these analyses. So it's quite clear what Dr. Symes wanted to do. He wanted to do basic testing on those cremains, i.e. put them under a microscope and do histological studies. But it's quite clear that the state does not want Kathleen Zellner to even present in front of a judge, right? And certainly doesn't want to give a bones uh, to Dr. Symes for testing. And remember, the state has already given the so-called human bones uh, back to the Hallbach family. Now, what is Kathleen Zona going to do? 
uh, subpoena the bones, subpoena the cremains. I mean, that's completely ridiculous. But the state obviously knew what they were doing when they immediately gave back uh, the cremains to the Horbach family. All right, guys, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Silkman from the Foul Play team. Um, and here is the link to our YouTube channel uh, where we've gone through a, a lot of presentations. We've gone over uh, making of a murderer one and number two, uh, and we've done um, analyses um, of all the various uh, uh, episodes. And we also do uh, other forms of analyses as well. Uh, please, if you want to have a look at these uh, presentations, uh, just check out the YouTube channel link. Uh, we're also um, present on Discord and uh, we're all waiting uh, with bated breath to see um, how Kathleen Zona responds to the state's uh, reply. Thank you very much. Catch you in the next presentation.